So while Pastor Ira is coming, I just got to tell you, I found this tie this morning and uh, I figured, what can they do, fire me? Uh, but it, it, it's a uh, cartoon characters and it was going to be my dad's 95th birthday present. And so uh, she said, I thought you would like to have this. And so I'm wearing this in honor of my dad today. Tell me you love my tie. <laughs> Wow, time got away from me. I was out there talking to people, and uh, we're glad that you're here. Welcome. If you're a little cold, it'll get warmer. It actually snowed here last night. Did you know that? It snowed over on uh, Iron Springs. Shauna said she woke up to snow at her house today. So it's, it's going to be a great winter. But we welcome you. We hope you'll find uh, the gray card that's in the, the chair in front of you. Uh, we'll let you know that Pastor Rich has had some surgery on his back for many, many months. He's Maybe a year, he's had extreme back pain that affected him, his legs especially. So he had some surgery this past week, so he's not with us today because he's recovering from that surgery. But um, hope you'll be praying. Um, a lot of you don't know this, but it's Pastor Rich that makes the videos, the announcement videos. He does that every week. That's his voice on there. And uh, we let him off this week. And I started to show the video again, but some of the things were past date. So we're going to do it the old-fashioned way today. You have a bulletin. You see the bulletin there? <laughs> Read it. Look at it. I will tell you that we, uh, we need your trunk or the back of your pickup for a trunk or treat. Treat, yeah, treat or trunk. We, yeah, we'll put you in the trunk if you don't give us a treat. No, it's the other way. So you can bring your pickup or your car, you bring the candy, and uh, that Wednesday night there, we're going to set up out here and invite the kids from the neighborhood and just uh, be kind and connect with people and meet people and invite some people on our campus maybe that have never been here, have been in many, many years. So if you know some children or family, invite them to come by. There'll be some games and some things happening here. But take a look at that. We need people with the gift of us. Did you know there was such a gift? Um, some of you out there, you've been looking for a way to connect, and we need ushers, and you can circle you on the card, so uh, the, the connect card, it's there in the pocket in front of you. We hope you'll take time to do that, and uh, we're just glad that you're here this morning. Now, we're going to start the service with what we call alabaster offering. Now, I was talking to a gentleman that this is his second Sunday here, and he says, what's alabaster offering? And I said, I'm glad you asked. So alabaster offering is something that's been around the Church of the Nazarene for many years. This particular box, it's called an alabaster box, is 60 years old. This is Pat Strickland's. She got this uh, when she was a baby. Actually, she got this <laughs> when she was a teenager. And uh, I said, what did they tell you? They said, well, this has to do, it relates to the lady who took the alabaster box of perfume and you know, anoint the feet of Jesus. It was a worshipful thing. And they were looking for ways to raise money to build buildings and, you know, buy schools and do mission work. And they came up with these cardboard boxes, which simply, you put your pocket change in. I know a lot of you didn't know about it or you forgot about it, but some of you brought, you brought them today. But what you can do is right now reach in your pocket and if there's a penny in there or some dimes or if there's a hundred dollar bill, you should have left that at home. And uh, <laughs> we're going to do an old Mark style offering. We'll take another offering again. We'll double up the regular offering. But we, we play some music. You come by and we have a wheelbarrow because this money goes for buying land and building buildings. And it does amazing things all around the world. 100% of it goes for that. And um, Pat, come up here and get your box. Where you at, Pat? Come on down. I'm going to have her dump it to start with. But it's just going to be a fun time. If you don't have anything, you can just stay where you're at. But stand with me, 
And we got some great music. Come bring your alabaster offering and dump it out for the Lord. You can even dance and sing if you want to, whatever you want to do. But come on, bring something to put in here, even if it's a dollar. It just adds up into millions. Wow, there you go, make some noise. I like this song. Isn't it a good song? You can sing if you want. It's the song of the redeemed Rising from the African plain We don't have a credit card machine, sorry. You can write a check. I've been doing this my whole life as a kid. It's an offering to the Lord. So you start saving your change for the next one, okay? Which will be in February, probably. February. Here you go, you can sing this. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Say hello to your neighbor. Let praises echo from the towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered underground. Of all the songs sung from the dawn of creation, some were meant to rise.
Let's worship together. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Sing with me. turned into wine open the eyes of the blind there's no one like you amen none like you into the darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you Good news. You sing it. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our
into the darkness, into the darkness we shine. Out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. Our God is greater. Do you mean it? Greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God. Amen. Has he stilled the storms in your life? Has he parted the waters in your world? Has he shown himself to be true in your life? Sing it with me. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, he's my God, our God is greater, our God is stronger. Our God, our God, and if our God, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Stand against. Oh. The Lord gives us encouraging scripture in Isaiah 40, 29 through 31. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will walk and not faint.
I just would invite you to be seated or kneel or remain standing. Just find a posture in which you could talk to God. Whatever might be on your heart today, you know, he tells us not be anxious about anything, but with prayer and supplication, make our requests known to God. Uh, one of the things that happened to me in uh, Sri Lanka was that uh, we went into the, the little Nazarene church there and uh, when they began to pray, they all prayed at once. Scared me to death. They prayed in two languages, and they beat the drums while they prayed. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to do that today, because I know it scares some of you too. But I, I'm bothered a lot of times that what we do is we listen to each other pray, and I'm bothered how we pray horizontally, <laughs> that sometimes we just say what we really want to say to everybody else but we're really not talking to God. I'm also quite concerned that we're really worried about the world's sin, but we're not worried about the sin that's in the church. There should be a great ample amount of confession and repentance in the church. Um, if, if there's not, we're not really tuned into the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, uh, convicts me on a regular basis of, uh, you know, where I've overstepped, where I've spoken unkind word, or maybe I've been more focused on myself than others. So Father, we come to you this morning and we first ask that you'd search us and see if there's any wicked way in us. Lord, um, forgive us for when we've tried to shape you into what we want you to be. Forgive us, Father, when we've, in all the ways as the Church of Jesus Christ, in which we've become consumers like the world we live in. Forgive us, Father, as the church, your church, where we've really lost our saltiness, when we're more like the world, Lord. Sometimes I, I'm, I'm embarrassed by how much I'm like the world. Father, forgive us for the harsh words we may have spoken this week, maybe even on the way to church, how we failed to be kind and good. Father, forgive us our trespasses this morning as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lord, I imagine uh, those here this day have might have been offended or wounded by somebody or this week, Lord, you reminded us of some broken relationship. Right now, we just choose to give grace to that situation. Lord, I, I pray for those who are grieving today, those who've experienced losses. It's interesting to finally be to the place where every memorial service has happened of those who've recently passed. We've come through such a season of loss. I just ask that you would comfort those here today that are still grieving. It's been difficult for some to keep coming to other services because each service just adds to the loss. So right now we just confess uh, that we have all these emotions about what's been taken from us, but we turn to you and we look to heaven, our home. And I thank you for allowing us as a church to stand in this place where we are with people as they enter the chute, man, as they cross that finish line, as we can encourage them to finish strong. But we pray for all of those that have experienced that loss this day. 
Lord, here in a little bit, we're gonna open your word. Forgive us for how we've forgotten or never really learned who Jesus is. For how can we be his followers if we don't truly know who he is? Forgive us, Father, for taking parts of your word and living it out, but ignoring others. Father, I pray that you'll move in upon us today through the work of the Holy Spirit. Without your spirit, I'm not so sure, I'm absolutely sure, Lord, we won't truly know how we ought to live. Come, Holy Spirit, convict us, strengthen us, empower us. We so need you to guide and direct us and to sanctify us and set us apart. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen.
All right, it's time for our tithes and offerings. And uh, ushers, if you'll come on down. Everybody here does such a wonderful job of giving and, and blessing the church with your first fruits and offerings. So I invite you again to give your first fruits and bless uh, God with your, with your tithes and your giving. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we get to come together, Lord, and we get to offer you our first fruits, Lord. We just pray that it blesses you and... Lord, it just warms our heart to give to you what we can give and what you have blessed us with. We thank you for all that you have given us, and we praise your name. In Christ's name we pray, amen. It's been a while since I've preached. Um, this could be really dangerous, is what I'm trying to say. You know, I've been, I was out of the pulpit here for three weeks, which is really unheard of for me. I did preach in Sri Lanka, being translated into two languages, so I could only preach for about five or 10 minutes, or it'd be quite long, to say the least. Aren't you glad I'm not being translated? Everybody said amen. Um, I'm going to do my best not to just unload everything that's in my heart and mind. I, I realize I have time, you know, down the road. Uh, I had kind of come to a place to where I had um, some sermon block, and I had been preaching week by week uh, before I went to Sri Lanka. I could say that the work and witness trip to Sri Lanka was a lot like that movie Men in Black when they have that little flashy thing and they erase your memory. You know, I'm sorry if you've never seen that, but my... It's like everything that was before was gone, and I, I sort of had a blank page to start on. But where my mind and heart kept going was uh, the kingdom of God. I'll never forget about 15 years ago that a lot of the youngsters, the young 
men and women who were new uh, uh, in terms of becoming pastors started talking all the time about the kingdom. And I'm like, what's all this kingdom talk? I mean, I actually mean even be frustrated with them. And then I remembered, oh yeah, we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And I began to read the New Testament with uh, this sort of uh, glasses on of the kingdom. You know, what is the kingdom of God? Because one of the tendencies we have is to forget about the kingdom of God and really think about our identity in terms of our nation and our state. And I mean, I met some people here, they're here this morning, they're from Texas. And I, I have a, a staff member who's from Texas and I'm from Oklahoma. And I'm just telling you, there's great identity even within our states, isn't that not true? And football teams and our identity, if we're not careful, can become more aligned with, with the world and where we're from or our political affiliations or even our football teams or wherever our ethnic backgrounds, but there's this thing called the kingdom of God. Have you ever heard of it? And you're a part of it. And it's all through, this, all through the New Testament. So I may, I may, I'm gonna leave this open, just talk about the kingdom. And there are many sayings of Jesus and other places that talk about the kingdom. And so this morning, the message is the kingdom of God is like, and then uh, we're eventually gonna get to Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 through 32. But don't go there yet, because I have a long ways to go before I get there. So maybe I should get started. I'm gonna start in Jeremiah. Oh, you're gonna say that's a long ways from Jeremiah to Matthew. But I, I just, in my own heart, and what God's saying to me, and and how I'm being taught by him and what I need to share with you, I need to start with Jeremiah 29, 11. And I meant to bring over a little plaque for my office. I have Jeremiah 29, 11 and a little plaque by my desk. And I have it on this huge metal sign in my office. And so most of us or many of us have heard of Jeremiah 29, 11. And it goes like this. God says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, Plans to prosper you, to not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And I know why we love that verse. We love that verse because it seems like as if God's trying to kill us at times, doesn't it? It seems like the last thing, I mean, does he even have a plan? Does God have a plan? I mean, we run into these circumstances and situations. So we love this verse, don't we? We buy it, we put it on the wall, we claim it, we appropriate it for our families. And I've done the same thing, and I believe it's absolutely true. But many of us, maybe most of us, have never read this verse in its context. I'm, and I don't want to ruin it for you, but I am going to run this for some of you today. You're gonna to have to let God reshape what this verse means. Because if you, if you read it backwards from there, if you look at it in the context of when it was said and who it was said to, you're gonna have a different view. It was written to the children of Israel, God's people, during a time of exile. They had been carried away into captivity to Babylon. The reason they had been taken to Babylon was the consequences of their own sin. They couldn't blame it on anyone else, although you'll see in a moment, God actually takes responsibility. He says, I'm the one who carried you away to captivity. Not, not the Babylonians, I was behind this. So they're being disciplined, they're in this terrible place, and their sin, you've heard me preach on this prior to Sri Lanka, much, very many times I preached about it, that they had said, we want to be like all the other nations. We want a king. They chose to put their trust and their ultimate hope in an earthly king and move away from God as their number one source of leadership. And they, they put it in government, the government of their day. That's where they put their trust and that's where they put their hope. And, and when they wanted to be like the world, they quit being the unique people of God and things unraveled. I mean, they unraveled. And I'm talking to people today that your life has unraveled because there was a day and time when you made that choice and you really didn't want to continue to be the unique people of God. There's been compromise in your life. But it's a story of grace, a, a grace and peace that God still gives them grace. He still gives them a path back to blessing <laughs> and, and here's the thing, though. Most of us have not read the verses leading up. Verse 10, 
Okay, hold on, I'm gonna just destroy some of you today. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. 70 years? That's a long time to wait. What if today you're facing this incredible, difficult situation and God says, and you go, I know God's gonna see me through this, and he says, in 70 years, some of them would never leave to see it. Some of them would never ever be there. And I wanna remind us that we won't be here to see all God does. You do know that. I mean, our perspective is so here. God's perspective is not that. We, we, will, we were born for eternity, not for time. And so here's this crazy thing. He says, 70 years. So what are the people of God to do while they wait? While they wait in a place where they have less influence than they used to have. Now we can apply this in so many ways. How many of you here are older? You'd say I'm old. In the Bible, there's a verse, this Iris paraphrase, when Jesus talked to Peter, he said, when you're young, you used to go where you wanted to go. When you're old, they're gonna tie you up and take you where you don't wanna go. True. You're going to have less influence as you grow older. I hate to tell you this, it happens. Has anybody's children decided they're smarter than you? <laughs> Has anybody's children trying to take over right now? Trying to tell us what to do. I'm like, what is wrong with these people? I mean, this started when they were teenagers, but it is full grown right now when they are about in their 30s. They're so smart. I'm sorry if you're that smart and you're 30, but they're just, they've gotten there. And I can tell I have less influence. I have different influence than I used to have. And so there's a sense in some ways now I feel like I'm in exile. And I think it's going to only increase as I get older. I finally figured out I, I'm turning 60 in December. Oh, you feel much better about it than I do. <laughs> But Christians, I believe, in the United States of America, and you may disagree, but I'm right and you're wrong, but I just want you to know, we have less influence than we used to have, and we will continue to have less influence than we have, because we live in a postmodern world, there's a cultural shift that is not changing, and we will find ourselves in a place of exile if we're not already there, and we can talk about this quite a bunch. I mean, such good news this morning, Pastor Brown. But what are the people of God to do in a nation, any nation that's increasingly less Christian, a situation, a time in history when, when your influence is waning? Well, I'm here to tell you we can find profitable teaching, correction, and there is correction here, training in righteousness if we keep reading backwards. So you didn't know you're gonna to be told to read backwards. We're gonna read backwards from Jeremiah 29, 11. We're gonna end up in Matthew. But here's what God says in Jeremiah 29, four through nine. Are you ready? And it's gonna be on the screen or read in your own Bible. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. And by the way, he says that over and over. I'm the one saying this. I'm the one saying this. This is the word of the Lord. To all those I, I carried into exile, so he takes responsibility from Jerusalem to Babylon. This just cracks me up. He's telling them they're gonna be there for a while. You hear this? Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. And I read that, and I hear him saying, <clears throat> it's gonna be 70 years. You need to live where I put you. You need to be where I put you. I put you in this time and place. I put you where you are right now. You need to live your life where you're at. And some of you are saying, well, man, that's not for me right now. I'm not having any more kids. I'm not, <laughs> I've got an empty nest. I don't know where you're at. But what he's saying is, you're to engage, you're to live life where he puts you. Some of you think you've got, well, when I'm there, I used to be there. Live life right down where he puts you. If you hate Prescott, live here. You know, build a house, have kids, be where God has put you. The age you're in, the time you're in, this season in history, let's be here, let's do it. 
And then he says, verse seven, this is so interesting. And this one actually speaks to me. Also seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. I think you could also add state and country. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. You do realize that, <laughs> that, that when judgment comes to a nation or a state or a city, you know, when everybody suffers, everybody suffers, whatever happens. And so we, he's saying, you, you know, I don't, are you like me? I just, I just like to go up in the hills and build me a compound, you know? I just like to disengage from this crazy world we live in. You know, there, there was something wonderful about leaving this country and going to Sri Lanka, but there's also something wonderful about coming back. But just to get out of this craziness, I didn't listen to the news for two weeks. Woo! I didn't, I didn't hear all the craziness going on here, and I come back here, and it just starts to press in on me. And I don't know if you figured it out, but this place is a mess. It's a mess. It's really messed up. And I'm sorry if that disappoints you that I feel that, but I so want to just disengage. I want to I want to be out of politics, out of government, and am I out of here yet? And just out of all the awful craziness and the divisiveness and the left and the right and oh my, the left and the right. It's just crazy. And I I more than in my ever life I don't want to engage this culture. I don't, I don't want to be any more boards that have to make hard decisions about all the nut stuff that's going on. I just want to be away from it. And then he says something like this. Work, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you. Wow. So here in the Old Testament, God's people are encouraged to be good contributing citizens in the nation they live in. But, here, this is dangerous. This, you're gonna hear me, this, he says stay engaged in the culture, stay engaged in what's happening where you live. Stay engaged in it. But listen to this warning, oh this is the best part of this. Yes, he says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. Get, get a hold of that phrase. Do you, I, I, this is new words for me. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. What? What does that mean? They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. See, God's people, like all people, are easily deceived into listening to the prophets and diviners among them. Now, I want to be careful about telling you who the prophets and diviners are of our day. <laughs> but they're here. The prophets were probably their spiritual people. The diviners were from the, the pagan culture they were in. It. But here, here's where I'm trying to say to it. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. <coughs> in other words... People play us like a fiddle. You do know that. You do know that people in power, and I don't care where they're at, this isn't Republican, Democrat, Independent, Communist, I don't care where it is in this world, people in power, people spend millions of dollars, advertisers, political strategists, they study us, they know the dreams that we have. They know what we want. They then craft their message to say what we want them to say to hear, not because they're going to do it, not that they're with us, not that they're one of us, but because they want to stay in power and they want to use us. You do understand this, don't you? And that is a part of the world system we're in. It even happens in the church. Great churches, big, giant churches in America that are these giant churches that have ceased to be the body of Christ, that are celebrity driven. There's a message that you want to hear. You, you know, I know what you want to hear. Do you know I know what you want to hear? Do you know how hard it is for me, even on a day-to-day, -to, -day, to say what I don't think you want to hear? 
because I really like to stay in power. I like to still have a job after this Sunday morning. I'd like to still be here next time the board does my review. There's such pressure on us to say what people want to hear. But the Lord God says this. We have to be careful. Idolatry is when we shape God to act and think like we think. And he has all these people work, the devil has all these people working with him to give us just what we want until before long the church and Christians and believers are not truly salt and light anymore. We've just become absorbed into our world system. We, we create God in our own image and it was true back then and it's true today. So I believe this is a warning for us as a church in America. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They're just feeding back to us what they think we want. And sometimes what we want, it really isn't what we need. See, there, there, are, there are two realms, two, two spheres that we live in. Uh, there are tremendous contrasts between those two realms that often pose a very difficult challenge for us. On the one hand, Christians are citizens of heaven, the heavenly kingdom with Christ as their Lord. And on the other hand, we're called of Christ to represent him in the midst of an age that is passing away, listen to me, an age that is passing away and a world system that is opposed to the plans and purposes of God. You need to know the whole world system is opposed to the plans and purposes of God. I'm talking about economics, I'm talking about government. You say, you're, you're messed up. No, you need to read your Bible. You need to understand that this is not our home. We act like it is. We want it to be. We, we try to shape it, but it's not. We're supposed to in, be in, but not of the world. Now, I, I grew up in, in the weird Nazarene church where we couldn't be like other people, you know? And nowadays in the church, it, you can be a Christian and be pretty cool. You can sing cool songs. You don't have to wear suits anymore. You can, you know, you can just kind of blend in. We don't look really weird. But back when I grew up, Nazarenes were really weird. Christians were weird sometimes. And we sort of just have been absorbed by the world. And I have real concerns, real concerns. On the other hand, we're called of Christ to represent him in the midst of an age that is passing away, a world system that is opposed to the plans and purposes of God. So we're in, but not of the world. So we live in the world, but we're not of the world. Now I put the verses on the slide there. You can read that. And those who live in this world, we are to live as aliens and sojourners and ambassadors for the Savior without being contaminated by the age and the world system whose God is the devil himself. You say, where do you get that? I get it from all those scriptures that are right there. I want you to understand, I just went to a country where I was the alien. That's such an interesting experience. Where I was one of the only white guys that was six foot three. Where I was different, where I was unique, where I stood out. And, and it's an interesting experience. You realize as Christians, <coughs> it's terrible how much we blend in how we don't stand out, how we're not different than the world, how we've adopted who they are and what they are. One of the passages that I think would be helpful to us is the book of Titus. I don't know when the last time was that you read it, but we all ought to memorize this verse, we ought to post it on our TV screen, we ought to put it next to our computer, we ought to burn it into our minds and heart, because here is good advice for us living in this world. And I, I think it's, it, it's is probably the heart of the message this morning. Here's what God says. Remind the people, because this is the New Testament now, and what world are they living in? The Roman Greco world, another culture. Remind the people to be subject to the rulers and authorities. Wow, that's tough when Caesar is your boss. To be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. There's the theme, whatever is good. To slander no one to be peaceable and considerate and always to be gentle toward everyone. They didn't have Facebook. In our last General Assembly, 
As the Church of the Nazarene, we had to write a new guideline about how to be nice on social media. We did. We voted on it. Because the meanness, if you've never experienced this, the meanness that is out there in that world, sometimes on behalf of what are Christians, is just incredible. Consider it always to be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice, envy, being hated, hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, see those words, kindness and love? He saved us not because of righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. You see that? He saved us. Okay, now this is the heart of this. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. That's what changes the world. That's what changes the world. Not, not, not any other power on earth. The only way, listen to me, the only way that things will be different in the United States or in this world or in your family or in my family is through the work of the Holy Spirit, the, the rebirth of a person spiritually where they testify like Jack McCullough did in his thing yesterday. He testified. We did his memorial service. When he was saved at 16, he claimed the promise that says, when you're in Christ, all things pass away, all things become new. That is the heart of what changes politics and countries and world regions. That is, that's where it has to start. And so he's focusing the church there, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful. Listen to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. So being peaceable, considerate, always gentle towards everyone is the way then and now to disapprove our critics as Christians. But we're also reminded over and over that we're resident aliens. I, I wanna remind us what Jesus said. Now he's, he's the guy we're following, right? Jesus, Christ-centered, are y'all still with me? Are y'all trying to figure out where I'm headed with this? Come on, hold on. Jesus, Christ-centered. We're everything else centered but Jesus-centered. We don't even know Jesus. We don't read. We, don't, we pick out the little parts we like about Jesus. Oh, we like this part, but I don't know about that part. But read Jesus in the Gospels. Read the Sermon on the Mount. It's the most convicting thing in the world. Jesus said to Pilate, in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. See, that's just cross grain, isn't it? If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Okay, pastor, but you just said while we're in exile, work toward the peace and the prosperity of the city and nation you're involved in. You said stay engaged in the culture. That's like you're saying, go up in the hills, don't have anything to do with it. I'm telling you, this is a conundrum, isn't it? How do we stay in the world but not a part of the world? How does one go about it? Let me just mention one thing. I'll just give you one practical piece of advice. This is for Ira Brown. I want to be disengaged from the political process. But if I disengage from it, especially in this place, I cease to be salt and light. Correct? So I have to find a way, which is so hard for me now, to stay engaged but not become like it. This Tuesday is the last day you can register to vote if you want to vote in the midterm elections. So every one of us here, Democrats, Independents, Republicans, the disillusioned, the apathetic, the communist, I don't know what all's here, all that's here. 
work toward the peace and the prosperity of where God has put us. It'll get harder down the road. I'll be a prophet. You'll find it hard to pick a candidate to even vote for. You'll wonder why does it even matter? But if we disengage from the process, we stop being salt and light. Now I know some of you are disappointed that I just didn't say just Republicans register or just Democrats register. I just real I know all that tension here. And you think everybody thinks like you. They don't all, not everybody thinks like you think here. And as a pastor, you know the most precarious thing in the world to do is to say what I just said. I want every person in this room to participate. Whatever, wherever you're coming from, I want you to participate. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? I want you to do that. But I want you to hear the warning from Jeremiah 29, 8. Do not <laughs> let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you dream. You encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. You cannot equate your faith with any political party. You cannot do it. I'm so troubled that we're so aligned with political parties now that we can't criticize them. Do you know it is the, it is the duty of the church of Jesus Christ to criticize, to confront every political party. <laughs> I'm amazed that when the Church of the Nazarene comes out with a statement on an issue, which really isn't about issue, but it was about people that some people go, oh, I can't believe they're being so political. No, they're being the church. The church, the church must take note when any political party is outside the word of God and the example of Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, you should applaud that. You should applaud it. <laughs> Jesus is our example. The Jesus who corrected and confronted the politics and government of his day, both secular and religious. I believe that Jesus would do the same thing today. I believe his church should do the same thing today. I believe Jesus would have much to say to Republicans. Some of you go, what would he have to say to us? You need to read and listen and learn who he is. I think he would have much to say to Democrats. And it's not a contest about who you'd have the most to say to. I think he has something to say to independents and people who have just disengaged. Christians are supposed to be salt and light and Boy, do our political system ever need salt and light. The church should never be so aligned with any political party or world system that it cannot confront or correct it. And that includes church government. Can I get on that for a minute? That includes the Church of the Nazarene, this amazing church that I've been a part of worldwide. If, if, if we, we must on occasion correct and confront the government of the church of the Nazarene. I've been a nonconformist more than once, you know? I've said that's wrong, that's, that's stupid. I've used the word stupid. I've confronted that, I've challenged that. I've had general superintendents come and eat breakfast with me every morning during camp meeting years ago because I was a nonconformist. Because I have to be salt and light within this same church. Does that make sense? And while I encourage you to work toward the peace and prosperity of this nation we live in, there is a better, there is a, there is a more powerful way to affect change. See, that's what I have to say to you this morning. There is the, there is the heart of who we are. That's how we see change. I, Zechariah 4, 6, who can quote it for me? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You do realize that's how we change the world. And without the work of the Holy Spirit, convicting us of sin, righteousness, and judgment, without that, without that, uh, there's no change. Because government and law eventually reflect the moral character of a nation. That's the way it happens. I'm telling you, that's the way it happens. And only as people are changed and transformed by God's grace and power. And I, I should move on. So, what if God were going to speak to the church today? 
Have you ever read what he wrote to churches in the book of Revelation? Well, surely that wouldn't be for our church. Surely that wouldn't be for Prescott, Arizona. Not us Americans. Oh, that might be for the church in Bangladesh. You know, those Nazarenes over there, they're so corrupt. Bangladesh is the most corrupt nation in the world. That's what I heard when I was in Sri Lanka from a leader. Because, oh, you know, they take bribes. You know how those people are. What about us? What about us Americans? Well, I, I believe Jesus might say something like this. Revelations 3, you say I'm rich and I've acquired wealth and do, do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. White clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. Salve to put on your eyes so you can see. And then he says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. I believe he dearly loves the church in America. I believe he withholds sometimes his, his uh, discipline from us because we do fund so much, but our money in the long run doesn't matter. And then verse 20, have you ever heard this verse? Revelation 3.20? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with that person and they with me. He's knocking to get back into our church. Jesus, not the Jesus we created, not the Jesus we want him to be, but the Jesus Jesus, the real Jesus who rebukes and confronts and disciplines and turns over tables in the temple and says, you guys got it all wrong. This is what I'm about. This is who I am. Read the Gospels again. Read the Gospels with what I'm saying to you this morning. Read the Sermon on the Mount. Understand that that's who the church is supposed to be. And if the church has lost its saltiness, what's it good for? Nothing. So he's knocking. He's saying, I want back into your church. I want back into your lives. I want back into your families. See, New, Christian, New Testament Christians were so counterculture that it even came out and they're greeting one another. And you've heard me preach on this. All through the New Testament, grace and peace was their common greeting. When they showed up, they didn't say, hey, how are you doing? They say, grace and peace. And they said that. You say, how, are you, how do you know that? I know that because when I look in the New Testament, Peter, John, and uh, Paul all started all their letters that way. Grace and peace. Grace, man, more than you deserve. Peace, nothing broken, nothing out of place. Paul, Peter, John, all greet their, church, their churches with these words, and I won't go through all of them, but I'll give you three examples. 1 Corinthians 1, 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 2, grace and peace to you be yours in abundance. 2 John 1, 3, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father, from Jesus Christ the Father's Son, who will be with us in truth and love. And so before any encouragement, any correction, any direction, Paul, Peter, John, all greet the churches with these words, grace and peace. Now that's grabbed a hold of me. It's grabbed a hold of me because in the Roman Greco world, that is not how you greeted people. That was not the foundation of life. It wasn't grace and peace. You get what you deserve. So you earn your way. You manipulate. You're strong. You're powerful. That's who rules. Now I'm a big guy. And I know how to use my physical presence and my voice. And anger. I know how to use anger to get my way. But you know, the anger of man does not bring about the righteousness of God. And me intimidating people or overpowering them or forcing them to do what I want to, that would be wrong, wouldn't it? Jesus' way is grace and peace. Radically different. It's upside down from the world. It was a new greeting. It was significant. And these early Christians greeted each other this way. May God treat you better than you deserve. That's kind of pointed. And may he take all the broken pieces and put them back together again. That's what I say to all our politicians today. May you get more than you deserve. That's what I say to everybody I meet, and I hope you'll say it to me, 
because I want more than I deserve. <laughs> See, the wages of sin is death. And it's not for grace and peace. And folks, I can't fix it. The, the, the United States government can't fix it. You can't fix your marriage today. You can't fix the mess you're in. You can't get yourself out of exile. There's only one person that can get us out of the mess we're in, and it's Jesus Christ. So we have to learn who he is, and we have to know who he is. And this is the message I shared with the Sri Lanka Work and Witness team on our first meeting on Saturday morning after traveling that 40 hours. And I got up, and I thought, what am I going to share with this team? I shared this simple message. I preached it to the Sri Lankan congregation, translated it into two languages. I don't think they got it, but I preached it anyway. And Ben and Alan were my roommates, and we had this huge room, and Ben and Alan and I were in the same room, and these guys would read their Bibles in the mornings. I'd see them reading their Bibles. And I don't remember which one it was, Ben or Alan, but they came up to me, and they, after hearing me talk about it, and they said, do you know what it says in 2 Peter 1, 2? It says, grace and peace be multiplied to you. That's even a better greeting. It says it this way, grace and peace be multiplied to you, and this is the part that's got a hold of my heart, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Until we know who Jesus is, really is, and put away our idols of who we've made Jesus, and take the whole of Jesus and all of his words, and stop taking our cue of who Jesus is from what we want him to be, he's just not the guy who fixes things up. Makes you feel a little better. You do know that. He's a guy who turns over tables. He's a guy who says really hard things to us. He's a guy who says, depart from me for you never knew me. You ever read the hard sayings? He's the guy who's, who just messed everybody up. He has something to say to every one of us. I get so tired. I feel angry right now. I get so tired of hearing our horizontal, horizontal praying I don't need you to preach to me while you pray. I don't need you to preach politics while you pray. I, you know what I need as a man that's younger than a lot of you men? I need you to confess your sin and humble yourself before God. My kids, my kids need to hear their father confess his sins and realize he needs God. To lay down my pride and my sin and my failures. My grandchildren need to see that. They don't need my preaching, political, whatever that junk is. Please stop it. Killing us. I grieve for young men and women who need to see an example of faith. And they see people that are more aligned with this world and his politics than they are their Jesus. And my heart aches because we have such an opportunity that wasn't in my notes. <laughs> Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Learning again the whole of who Jesus was and what he is. Well, they said that to me that morning. And I was thinking about it. And we went to the Child Development Center that morning. It was the last day we were going to work. And I said, thank God, this is the last day we were going to work. It's hot. It's miserable. We all smelled like curry. We stunk. <laughs> um, and that day, they wanted us to clean up the site. I didn't want to clean up the site. I thought it was already clean enough. I want to be in charge. We didn't have tools to clean up the site. We, we had a few shovels. What do you mean you want to clean up the site? They want us to clean up the site. We pull in in our nice bus. And on the road that led to the Child Development Center, it's a dirt road. It is a government property road. There's a preschool. There's a midwife. It says Australian... Um, World Vision Midwife, Australian World Vision or something like that, funded, nobody was there. And then there was this little building. That's a holy cow in front. 
if I ever die, I want to come back as a cow in Sri Lanka. That's all I'm saying, if that's possible. Not a dog, but they're everywhere. And on there it says, <laughs> it said, uh, Government Office of Economic Development. <laughs> that's what it said. And you understand what a poor country it is. There's nobody there. And then right across the road, the government, the government gave the Church of the Nazarene that piece of land. So it's like the government realizes they need help. They've had a civil war up there, messed up place. And they give us the land across the road. So we drive up, and that morning when we drove up, right, we're gonna clear the land, right? We look across, and there's like 15 women and only two men, and they got the hose, the mambooties, and they're clearing the land. Now this is what it looked like. Women across the road. and prosperity of the city you live in. They're, I don't know if they're getting paid or they just all showed up, but they're over there hoeing the weeds and mostly women. So I took a video of it because it was so interesting. I'd never seen that happening. So we go over and um, uh, we start using our two shovels and trying to pull all our stuff up off the lot. And it wasn't going really fast. And Trino, who's the regional field strategy coordinator for Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, India, all those areas. He's like the boss. He's on site with us. And Trino is Colombian, but he's called to be a missionary. He went to Africa. And then he's in Africa, and then he moves to Armenia and marries an Armenian. And he's a missionary in Armenia. And then he's the regional director over South Asia. Talk about a worldwide church. No boundaries. He comes up to me. He's a short little, short little round guy. And... Uh, he said, Pastor Ira, I've got some candy, some Armenian chocolate, and I want your ladies to take the chocolate, and I want you to go across the road and give it to those ladies. Would that be okay? And I said, yeah, and I'm wondering how he has chocolate that's not melted because it's 95 degrees and 105 degree heat index. I said, sure. So he gives it to the ladies, and I see the ladies cross the road, go over and give them chocolate. And uh, we go back to working, and I'm actually helping somebody that's not feeling well over by the outhouse because it's the only shade I can find, and I'm talking to them. And Trino comes back, and he goes, Pastor Ira, Pastor Ira, <laughs> he says, he says I, I want you to come and see what's happening. Something amazing is happening. And what happened is all the women who were over there, after they got the piece of chocolate, they come across the road. They all come across the road with their mambooties, their hose, and they're clearing the land. I mean, it's like this human machine. Here's what it looked like. And listen to what I say to Alan. Hey, this is grace and peace multiplied, Alan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Got the motorcycle. People started stopping on the road and going, what's going on here? What's happening? What's going on? These people are Hindu and Buddhist, okay? They're not Christian. They live in the neighborhood. I don't know why they're, they, they moved from that side of the road to this side of the road. You see that? It was amazing. And there's Ann with her shovel trying to keep up with them. And they just see them, they're just chopping and chopping and chopping. There's two men in there and the rest of them are women. And it was, it was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Grace and peace was multiplied. I'm standing there videoing this, laughing and talking, and I got the mambooty, the hose sitting right there beside me, and I'm not using it. And this little lady about this tall comes over with piercing green eyes, and she looks up at me, and she's showing off for all the other women is what she's doing, because she's got the big white guy there, American, and she starts going, da 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 and Tom will tell da 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 telling me that I need to pick that up and use it. She's like, da 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 you need to use it. So I showed her that I knew how to use it, and then I said, somebody get a video camera. I want them to see me doing this. And so this is what what happened. We had a hoedown. 
is what we had. That's, you know, thank you. I have to show it to you again. And then I went over and put my arm around her. All those 15 ladies just cackled and laughed. You say, what's the big deal about that? That is the kingdom of God. Do you understand that? That's the kingdom of God. He takes the most simple acts of kindness. I, when Trino said, go give him chocolate, I thought, eh, eh. And what Trino told me was the fact those ladies came across the road, came on that property, and participated in the way they did, meant that they now identified with the site, and they were most likely to send their children there now, there was a government official who came to that office that day, and everybody hovered around him. I knew he was somebody important because they were like, oh, oh, government official. Here, government. They all just followed him around. They introduced me to him. And, and the, I mean, I didn't speak. I don't know who he was, but he was the guy who worked in that office. He was some sort of big cheese in the neighborhood. I could have gone to the government official, couldn't I? I said, I want you to help me get these people. To, you know, I could have tried to. I didn't have any influence there. You do realize I had zero influence. They could care less who we were. But a small act of kindness, with God's help, open a door. And through that simple act, children will come there. Children will be fed. They'll be clothed. They'll hear the gospel. Some of those ladies will become believers in Jesus Christ. Their hearts and lives will change. Their culture will change. If that happens enough in a nation, what happens to the nation? The nation changes. Its laws change. The way they function changes. Folks, that is what the church is about. We're part of the most powerful thing that ever landed on planet Earth. We're part of the Jesus Christ kingdom here. We're doing something. And so... Grace and peace be multiplied. That's what I'm trying to say. And this whole thing reminded me of another verse. One last verse. Said, I told you I'd get here, so I'm ending the thing right here. Another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it's grown, it's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. See, God's big enough to start small. He can start with a mustard seed. He can start with a baby in a manger. A manger. A feeding trough. In a stinky stable. Not a prince in a palace. You do get that's why he did that. Jesus came into Jerusalem. Not riding on a war horse. What did he ride on? Learn Jesus. Came riding on a colt. Jesus. Who let them crucify him for heaven's sakes? What a loser. See, that's what they thought. What a loser. His people won't even fight for themselves. Opposite of the culture he was in. Rather than asserting his authority, he laid down his life. Philippians 2, 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather... He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that is the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'll, um, I'll skip to my last story because I've gone too long, but Paul and I, back when there was Sunday night church, does anybody remember that? We used to go to church a lot. We would, on our way home from our church in Mesa, we would stop at a Red Robin just across US 60 on Stapley. And we'd go in there and we got, a, we, we got acquainted with a young waitress by the name of Bernadette. 
Bernadette was Hispanic, Latino girl, and she knew us and we knew her and we go in there and we had a, we'd always go to her table because we just wanted to be with Bernadette. And one night Bernadette was taking our order and this group of people came in and she goes, oh no, the churchies are here. And I said, churchies? She goes, oh yeah, those people come in here after church on Sunday nights. And she goes, they're so mean and catty and nasty to us and they don't tip at all. I said, I don't think I've ever told you what I do, Bernadette, but I'm a pastor of a church. And I want to apologize to you. I feel so terrible that anybody associated with Jesus Christ would act like that. That's not what we're supposed to be. How we behave. Go back and read Titus again. Be kind, be gentle, be caring. We represent Jesus Christ. I just, I just want to ask you, if um, would you just lead a revolution with me in this entitled, affluent town? This is one of the ruder places I've ever lived because everybody's got the cruise ship mentality. There's a lot of entitlement. At the YMCA, I hear people grumble about children. Why are there kids here? They're just running this place. Why? Oh, I just can't believe all these. Leave the revolution with me in this place to be kind and gentle and to be servants. Lead a revolution in this town with me to wash people's feet, to, do the, to be like our Lord and Savior. Would you do that with me? Would you lead a revolution with me to be the best tippers in the world and to not be the complainers? But you just, we can be so effective and you say, well, I, no, we need to do this. We need to, no, we need to be Jesus Christ in this place. And we need to work toward the peace and prosperity. I'm, I'm with you on that. Let's do that. And let's let the word of God speak into all these places that we're in. If you want to pray about this and just ask God to use you, I'm going to close with the song I, and I used last week in the service, Let It Begin With Me. And we're planting trees in this video. When they said they were going to put a tree in our name, I was, a little, I was like, oh, man, oh, that's so cool. I'm going to have a tree with my name on it. And then I realized, oh, that's not like Jesus. And he reminded me that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Um, just um, doing what we did there could change a nation. You know, that seems so, so it could change a nation. Doing the same thing here could change a nation. So this is a closing prayer video. I hope you'll come pray and some of you just come pray with me and say, God, let it begin with me. This was very meaningful to me when we did this, when we planted the trees, because I, I anticipate what God's going to do and what he's going to do as we sow seed. And as we work in many different realms, may God use us as believers. city soaring town empty people live in darkness every minute every hour hear the cry of desperation from a billion broken hearts with a need so great where do we even start 
Father, that is our prayer today. We, we ask that it would start with us. We ask that you would uh, break in upon our lives, draw us to your word, make us receptive to who Jesus is and was. Help us to truly reflect him and be imitators of Jesus. Help me as a pastor to be that way. I, I know I have much to adjust in my life. But I pray that in this place, you'd help us to sow seeds of kindness. Help us, Lord, as we do participate in government and in other activities in our community and state and nation. Call some of us to that work. I, I can't imagine what that would be like. But I pray, Father, we pray for the peace and prosperity of our city, our state, our nation. Lord, we know you're the only one who can fix it. Help us not to adopt the things of the world, but somehow you can guide us to be salt and light. But I pray that we would be like the early church who brought down the mighty Roman Empire by living out the Sermon on the Mount for hundreds of years. That's what I want you to do through the church in America. Bring about revival and renewal and transformation. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. We'll play that again as they go. Let that song echo in your minds. Let it start with me. Hope to see you next week. get more than you deserve as we will also through that song. In the streets of every village, every city soaring town, empty people live in gardens, every minute, every hour. Hear the cry of desperation from a billion broken hearts with a need so great. Where do we even start? Let it start.